when you look at One Health, we've redefined, we are redefining what health means. Uh, the last century we focused on homo sapiens, hum humankind, and said how can we improve their quality of life. Uh, we now need to use our technology and skills to look not only at humankind but also the planet. So the convergence of an extraordinary growth in the population from 2 billion to 9 billion within 100 years, the, the impact that has on the greenhouse gases and on our uh, resources of the globe mean that if if we're going to make sure we have a sustainable globe, we've got to start to measure our health in tandem with that of the globe and the planet. So the health of the planet is now inseparable from the health of humankind, and we have to adjust our approach. We're starting to have structures attending to the issue of energy, and energy is about the health of the planet and the expression of greenhouse gases. So we're going to have the Copenhagen meeting as a critical meeting following up after the failure of Kyoto and the Kyoto Accord with the Americans opting out. Well, this time, it really looks like Copenhagen will come together and there will be a global response because, once again, greenhouse gases don't recognize affluence or national borders. They are created by affluence and we've got to find a way of ensuring we can deal with the uh, expression of CO2 of 9 billion people, let alone the 6 billion we have today. That is dealing with the health of the planet. But when we look at global health, uh, you know, it's no longer sustainable that we have 40,000 children dying a day from diseases from which we can protect them today with today's technology. Viruses and bacteria don't recognize national borders or affluence. They have recognized in the past changes in climate, but as the world warms up and it is warming up, then we can expect to see more of the tropical diseases, dengue, tuberculosis, which has got a really strong hold now in Southeast Asia, uh, malaria, starting to move into the West. We've seen the world respond in HIV, partially, I think, out of a degree of concern because it's still the disease that terrifies the West. But there are many diseases in the tropics which we could today prevent. We only have to do a little bit more by way of resource organization to ensure that we give those children, as they're born, the protection that they deserve and the liberty that they could achieve. But what we really have to do is understand how we monitor and protect the globe against these pandemics because it doesn't take uh, much by way of a mutation within a virus to make it deadly, just as the way Spanish flu was deadly after the First World War. We tend to forget Spanish flu after the First World War killed more people than the First World War itself. I think also we've got an extraordinary change in our awareness of the inequalities of health across the world. And that awareness, which we're reminded of on a daily basis, is something now that the industrial side is starting to attend to. So globalization is moving us to new market opportunities with the BRIC territories, Brazil, uh, India, China, Russia, becoming seen as market opportunities. But at the same time, we're saying we've got to deal with global health and when we look at disease patterns around the world, they're very different to those that we explore in, uh, Western, in the Western world, the market which has previously been really defined by the needs of North America. So industry is responding, starting to respond to global needs and is starting to feel globally accountable, which to me is something of an essential breakthrough because global industry is not accountable to any democratic national electorate. It has to determine itself how it uh, displays its skills and answers some of the key challenges of the world. We need a, we need a culture which is tr truly global in its awareness, a, a culture globally which understands that technology is a major part of the solution mm -hmm. to a sustainable world. But if we look forward to One Health as an agenda, we need to bring the industrialists, the academics, the politicians together across the borders, form partnerships in the world and have create a common understanding and a common agenda. Not a controlled agenda, but a common agenda. Industry has an incredible role. Only they know how to bring the resources to change the world. Politicians have an extraordinary role. They have to set the regulatory framework, but they have to encourage us first and foremost. 
So they've got to be a partner in this great invention, not sitting back as a regulator. So we want partnership first from the politicians, being an enabler of the common quest, and then regulation. Mm -hmm. And academia has a vital role to play in terms of being the knowledge hub of the world. Uh, and the great universities are the only places where we bring humanities and science together. And as we embrace technology and science, we need the humanities to help us understand how to mould that successfully into the evolving culture of mankind. We need to see the energy crisis and greenhouse gases as a imperative for all of us. It's a way of re-stimulating our economies. It's a way of having a common cause. It's a way of leaving something for the future. And you no, know, this aren't my generation. We've become incredibly materialistic. There seems to be less concern about future generations. We need to move our awareness and our culture in the world from one which focuses on materialism to one that embraces the aspects of how do we achieve sustainability? How does mankind accept the responsibilities, not only for himself and for his family, but also for all of the species of the world? Why, why, should, we, why should we alone dominate? Those are issues we need to discuss, understand. Without a change in our approach to uh, the survival of the planet as being a common goal, then individually no one will survive.